Well, good morning, Sobel family and friends. My name is Chris Higginson, and I'm the pastor of Blue Water Church in Kincardin. And it is a real privilege for me to be able to uh, spend some time with you today in God's Word. And uh, we're going to get right into it. This is going to be part two of a mini-series that we're simply calling First Impressions. And we're calling it that because we're borrowing that title from Sobel's Welcome Ministry. And so we're talking a lot about welcoming. We're talking about hospitality, but not hospitality Martha Stewart style. This is hospitality kingdom of Jesus style. And so we're looking to God's word to really try and develop a theology of hospitality. Our anchor verse that we'll come back to uh, each of these weeks is Romans chapter 12 and verse 13. So if you have your Bible handy, you can open it up or turn it on to Romans chapter 12 and verse 13. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. And that word hospitality there that Paul uses, the Greek term is philozenia. We talked about it last week a little bit. Philo comes from phileo, uh, which means to love. The zenia comes from xenos, which means stranger, foreigner, other those who are unfamiliar to you and unlike you, different from you. So philozenia then is the love of stranger, the love of the foreigner, the love of the other, the love of those who are unlike you and unfamiliar to you and different from you. It's the exact opposite of xenophobia. We talked about that last week too, xeno from xenos, meaning again, that same stranger, foreigner, other. And phobia meaning fear. So xenophobia, rather than a love of the stranger, is a, is a suspicion of the stranger, a fear of the stranger, and sometimes even a, an outright hatred of the stranger, the foreigner, the other, those who are unlike us and unfamiliar to us, different from us. And so the call of the follower of Jesus is to always be eager to practice hospitality, to practice philozenia. And yes, we do have an inward look. We are to care for the needs that exist in the church, but we don't merely have an inward look. We also have an outward look. Pastor Dave would describe this as, as not an either or, but a both and, an inward and an outward look. And so we look to the stranger and the foreigner and the other, and we what? We love them. And uh, last week, as we began to develop this theology of hospitality, this theology of philozenia, we spent some time in the Old Testament and we looked at some passages there. One of the passages that we looked at was uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10. And it's in that passage that God tells the Jewish people to love the foreigner, to love the stranger, to love the vulnerable. That was the passage where God talks about the fact that he loves all without partiality. And, uh, you know, looking through a Jesus lens, we can't help but think of the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus talking about the love of a father, the love of God who loves indiscriminately and without partiality, loves like the rain falls and loves like the sun shines. And it was in that Deuteronomy 10 passage as well where God uh, lets us know that he loves to ensure justice for the widow and for the orphan, that he loves to feed and he loves to clothe the foreigner and the poor. And so we looked um, at Deuteronomy 10, verse 19. It goes like this. So you too must show love to foreigners, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. And then we looked at Uh, Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 and 34. I'm just going to read those by way of review. This is, again, this is God speaking to the Jewish nation. Do not take advantage of foreigners who live among you in your land. Treat them like native-born Israelites and love them as you love yourself. Again, you see Jesus here loving others as we love ourselves. Remember that you were once foreigners living in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And so as we looked into the Old Testament 
last week, we noted that a couple of reasons uh, really came to the surface in terms of why it is that the Jewish people are to love the foreigner and the stranger and be hospitable to them. Reason number one is because God's like that. God is hospitable. And reason number two was that they ought to be able to remember how horrible it was to be mistreated as a foreigner in a foreign land when they were in Egypt. So be hospitable because God is hospitable and remember how awful it was when you were a stranger and mistreated as foreigners and then don't do that to anybody else. In fact, do the opposite. Love them, love the stranger, love the foreigner, love the foreigner as if they were a natural born Jewish citizen. Love them as you love yourself. And so today what we wanna do is uh, we wanna to look to the New Testament as we continue to develop this theology of hospitality. And what we'll find in the New Testament is that the, the same two reasons that God gave to the Jewish nation as to why they should be hospitable to strangers and foreigners are the same two reasons that God is gonna to give to us as to why we ought to practice philozenia, this hospitality. Number one, we practice hospitality because God does. God practices philozenia, and so we are to as well. And the second reason is that we ought to remember what it was like to be strangers and foreigners, not in Egypt, but strangers and foreigners to God. So um, let's, let's go to Ephesians chapter two. And uh, if we had all kinds of time, I'd love to read the entire chapter because this chapter is just so uh, rich. It's just such a beautiful, full description of the philozenia of God. But um, I'll just pull out a few verses and read those. But just before I do, let's just pray and ask God to help us as we, as we go to the word today. Father, thank you for your word. We pray, God, that we would have open uh, minds, open eyes, open ears, open hearts, open hands to receive what it is that you have for us today. God, help us in this moment not merely to settle for information, uh, but Spirit of God, would you bring about transformation, transforming us into the image and likeness of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, and we pray in his name, amen. Uh, Ephesians chapter two, verse one. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And then skip down to verse four. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. And then drop down to verse 13. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. And then go down to verse 19. So now you Gentiles are no longer, look at this, no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. And so we wanna pull out a few things from this uh, awesome chapter. First of all, just notice that Paul doesn't uh, say that it's not like you were just strangers. It's not as if you were just strangers to God. He says you were dead, you were dead. Without Jesus, Paul says your relationship with God is like that of a corpse to a living person. And Paul's point is that corpses don't have relationships with living persons because corpses are dead. You can take a corpse and you can go to the library and you can read them a book. You can take a corpse and uh, bring them to church. You can even raise their hand during the music. 
you can take a corpse and you can do the weekend at Bernie's thing and put a hat on them and sunglasses and, and prop them up and dress them up and move their arms like a marionette. But the fact is they're dead and the dead have no relationship with the living. So talk about being a stranger to God, so estranged from God, so other, so outside, so foreign as if to be dead. And Paul says in verse 19 that you were strangers and foreigners to God, outsiders to God. And if that's not bad enough, you go back to verse 2 and you see that we were enslaved by the commander of the powers in the unseen world that Satan is talking about. And so Paul is really being quite blunt here that without Jesus, says Paul, you are enslaved corpses, enslaved to the power of Satan, enslaved in the foreign kingdom of darkness. You couldn't possibly have been more foreign to God. You couldn't possibly have been more of an outsider. You couldn't possibly have been more xenos to God. But, verse 4, but when we were xenos, what did God do? Showed us rich mercy extravagant philozenia, extravagant hospitality, extravagant welcome. And when we were outsiders, he made us insiders in Christ. He looked at us with extravagant compassion, extravagant welcome, extravagant mercy. He made us, we were dead and he made us alive in Christ, raised us up with Christ, seated us with Christ. Out of his grace, he's forgiven all of our sins. He's wiped the slate entirely clean. This enemy to whom we were enslaved and in bondage, who held this book of crimes over our head, well, God's destroyed that and he's set us free from our bondage. And so we, you know, verse 13, we who were once so far away have been brought near. How near? How near have you been brought? or branged, or branged, whatever it is. You know what I mean. So near that we were outsiders and now we're insiders. So near that we're in Christ. You are so near that Christ is in you. You are so near, verse 13, that we are, like we're united together with Christ. Like think about the Trinity for a second. Father, Son, and Spirit uh, dwelling together in this relational unity, this triune unity. Um, and think about the Son, the second person of the Godhead, like the ultimate insider in the Trinity. And then where are you? Well, you're inside the insider, and the insider is inside you. You can't get closer than that. You can't get closer than in. You can't get closer than united together with Christ. And I sometimes get a little bit frustrated, I suppose, um, sometimes around New Year's, like New Year's resolution time, which is almost always a bad idea, but sometimes, you know, well-meaning Christian people will say, you know, the, my, my uh, resolution for 2021 or whatever is, I just wanna get closer to Jesus. I just feel like I'm not very close to Jesus. And so this year I wanna move closer to Jesus. Well, here, here's the thing, you can't get closer than in. So rather than trying to to get closer than in, let's just recognize our position in Christ and, and live out of that. And not only that, but if we went back a chapter and looked at chapter one and verse three, we'd find that God has poured out this, uh, this treasure trove of blessing upon us. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we, who were as far away as we possibly could be, God loved us in that condition. He showed us incredible philozenia, welcome, hospitality, to the extent that now I am inside the insider. I am loved by the Father with the same love with which the Father loves the Son. God says, everything I have, I now give to you. Everything that belongs to Jesus by nature now belongs to me by grace. It's an incredible thing. We inherit the kingdom. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. His peace becomes our peace. The peace that Jesus has, the intimacy with Father and Spirit is now my intimacy with Father and Spirit. 
We've been brought so near that we're in. This is the hospitality of God. We were so estranged, we were dead, but now we're alive in Jesus. We were strangers and now we've got a seat at the family table. We were hostile outsiders and now we've been welcomed in and are much loved insiders. Now we're family. That's philozenia, that's hospitality. And you know what? God didn't have to do any of that. Why did he do that? Well, verse four, because he's so rich in mercy. And Jesus, you know, nobody forced Jesus to leave the glories of heaven to come to this earth and to, you know, what Paul says in Philippians chapter two, to empty himself, to, to set aside his divine prerogatives, to, to uh, set aside his independent usage of his attributes as God. Nobody forced them to do that. Nobody forced them to become a human being. Nobody forced them to become a servant and to become obedient to death, even death on a cross. Nobody forced Jesus to subject himself to the mocking and the beating. Uh, nobody forced him to, um, to Calvary. In fact, Jesus said, um, no one takes my life from me, I lay it down myself. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this than, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. It's only because of God's mercy. Jesus left his home in heaven and actually became a foreigner so that we could become family. And so God looked at us and he saw us as aliens and strangers. He saw us as enslaved corpses, enslaved to Satan, enslaved in this foreign kingdom of darkness. And he had compassion on us. And he was willing to do whatever it took, whatever it took in order for us to be able to become family. That's philozenia. That's extravagant hospitality. That's the unfathomable love of God. And that's what we're called to. We're called to be hospitable because number one, God is that way. God's hospitable. And we're called to be hospitable, number two, because we remember what it was like to be strangers, foreigners to God. Romans chapter 15, verse seven, I'll just read that. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. Another version, the NRSV puts it this way, welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So accept each other, welcome each other, just as Christ has welcomed you. And we just talked about how Christ has welcomed us. Ephesians chapter five, verses one and two say these words, Imitate God, therefore. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love. As long as you live, love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So imitate God in his hospitality. Imitate God in his generosity. Imitate God in his self-sacrificial love and extend that to all others at all time, uh, in all circumstances, no if, ands, or buts. To do it like the sun shines and like the rain falls in every situation. And if we do that, we'll be practicing philozenia. We'll be welcoming the stranger. We'll be sharing with those in need. We'll be making space for the other. We'll be putting on display the hospitality of God. Jesus kind of drills down on this um, in, in an interesting way in Luke chapter 14. I'm gonna read verses 12 to 14. The context is Jesus has been invited to the home of a, of a prominent Pharisee and uh, they're having this banquet. And so Jesus turns to the host and he says these words in verse 12 of Luke 14. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. So when you guys throw a party, which I know you do, 
uh, and you invite people from, like from your own social circle. When you invite people with whom you're familiar and comfortable, um, you get repaid in probably a few ways for doing that. One is I think you get repaid just in the fact that we're, I don't know, we're further enhancing, enhancing and strengthening uh, good social relationships. That's a kind of repayment. There's a reward in that. And when you invite people to your party who, with whom you're familiar and comfortable, you get paid back in the sense that you know, there's a strong likelihood that those same people, when they throw a party, they're going to invite you. And uh, there's, a, there's a repayment in that. That's what Greg Boyd calls quid pro quo hospitality. And we're familiar with that kind of hospitality, that, that this for that kind of hospitality. I think it's the, it's the kind of hospitality that's practiced probably in every culture all around the world, likely for all of human history. It's certainly the kind of hospitality that was practiced in uh, Jesus' day. You just invite those you're comfortable with, those with whom you're familiar, this quid pro quo kind of thing. Like the rich people in Jesus' day, well, they would never invite the poor and the, the lame and the blind. They would never do that because how do you get paid back for that? No, the rich people would invite the rich people. That's how you get paid back. Quid pro quo hospitality. And what Jesus is saying to us is that kingdom hospitality is going to be different. Now, Jesus doesn't say that we can never have friendship parties. He doesn't say that we can never just hang out with people that we're familiar with and comfortable with. But what he does say for sure is that there's nothing distinctly kingdom about that. Everybody does that. So when you throw a party or host a luncheon and you invite people that you're familiar with and comfortable with, like we, in that moment, we don't somehow pat ourselves on the back as if we're doing this amazing kingdom work because everybody does that. That's, that's normal. There's nothing distinctly kingdom about that. But what is distinctly kingdom is when you throw a party or when you host a meal and you invite people that you're not familiar with. When you invite people who are strange to you, you invite people who wouldn't normally be invited to your kind of party. You invite the poor, you invite the disabled and the blind. And those were the people in the first century. Well, they, they were never on anybody's guest lists. They were the invisible, they were the unwanted, they were the marginalized, and they were the disconnected, they were the xenos to everybody. And so you really put on display the hospitality of God when you invited the poor and the lame and the, the foreigner and the disabled and so on to your party. That's the opposite of quid pro quo hospitality and instead it puts on display this outrageous hospitality of God. This is how Jesus lived. This is how the early church operated. You think about Jesus, think about the people that he hung out with. He hung out with prostitutes and tax collectors. He made space for them. He welcomed them in. He ate with them. He went to their homes. He partied with them. If Jesus was, was a typical first century Jewish rabbi, he never would have hung out with prostitutes and tax collectors. He would have steered a, a country mile um, around them. But he didn't do that. He made space for them. He welcomed them in. You know, the prostitutes and the tax collectors, they flocked to Jesus. They fled from the Pharisees because they didn't want their judgment, but they flocked to Jesus. And you know, wouldn't it stand to reason that whatever the 21st century equivalent of the first century tax collector and prostitute, wouldn't it make sense that they're flocking to the church? If we're followers of Jesus, wouldn't they flock to the church? But my sense is that they're more fleeing the church, more like they fled from the Pharisees. And if you just follow Jesus around in the Gospels, you find that he, he just continually hung out with people that he referred to in Matthew 25 as the least of these. The invisible, the marginalized, the poor, the sick, the oppressed, people in need. Those were the people that Jesus spent most of his time with. I think as we look at the Gospels, it seems like he went everywhere that he was invited, but it seems like rich people didn't really take all that much interest in Jesus, and Jesus just 
uh, hung out a lot with those on the margins and just continually manifested this hospitality of God, welcoming in, making space for people who wouldn't normally be welcomed in. And the early church operated like this. The early church continually pushed back against the current, the momentum of Roman quid pro quo hospitality. The, the early church literally invited everybody to everything, regardless of social status, regardless of race, regardless of ability or disability. It didn't matter whether you had a, a great reputation or whether your reputation was in tatters. It didn't matter what your ethnicity was. The early church invited everybody to everything and treated them all as equals, not an us and them kind of thing, just an us. The early church put on beautiful display the New Testament truth that in Christ there is no rich or poor, there's no slave or free, there's no male or female, there's no Jew or Gentile, there's no black, brown, white. It's just in Christ. If you're in Christ, it's just in Christ. That's kingdom hospitality. The early church would take in orphans and, and the widows and others who had no way to support themselves. There was no social safety net that I'm aware of in the first century, and really the church became that social safety net for people. You know, and here we are living through a pandemic. But thankfully in our day, we've got such medical expertise and such brilliant scientists who can create models and project um, trends and, and uh, take steps to mitigate uh, transfer of virus and those kinds of things and institute things like social distancing in order to keep us safe. And I'm so thankful for all of that, but that didn't exist in the first century. So when bubonic plague would blow through a Roman city, it would kill half the population. And they had social distancing in a sense, I suppose, because as soon as, as, soon as people began to get sick and die, the healthy people would just flee. They would just take off for higher ground. And the trouble was they would just leave everything behind. They'd leave behind businesses. They'd leave behind children. They'd leave behind elderly parents. And guess who became the, the, the frontline workers? Guess who became the, the, the essential services? It was the church. It was the Christians. They, they cared for the abandoned children. They cared for the, the elderly, for the dying. They even tended the graves of, of those who were dead regardless of what their faith was or their ethnicity. Rodney Stark talks about first century Rome and he, he draws attention to this thing, this practice called uh, death by exposure. And if you're a Roman family and you have a baby and that baby is deformed or disfigured in any way or born female, you may just want to discard them and you may take them down to the seashore or up into the, to the mountains and just leave them there to literally die by exposure, by, by extreme temperature or starvation or animals or whatever. And the church, well, they would go out at night under cover of darkness and they would listen for the cries of these precious abandoned babies and they would scoop them up and they would take them home and they would raise them as their own. That's hospitality. That's philozenia. That's outrageous generosity and welcoming. The early church literally risked their lives for the stranger, for the foreigner, for the other, for those who were unfamiliar and unlike them, different from them. And it stood out as distinctly kingdom. And of course, in the first century, there's spans of time where Christianity is, is illegal and the church is, is brutally um, persecuted. And regardless, the church continued to grow rapidly. Why? Because of this outrageous hospitality. In Acts chapter 2, there's a little section, verses 42 to 47, where uh, Dr. Luke talks about how the church found favor with all the people, all the people, and no wonder, because they were just constantly putting on display what it is that God looks like. This hospitality that had been extended to them, well, it was just natural to want to extend that to all others, and they did, and the church grew rapidly. They put on display the generosity of God, and they were radically generous, not because of some low-bar, old covenant 
percentage, but because they were just radically generous, imitating a God who is radically generous in hospitality and welcoming. And so the kingdom of God is about loving the Zenos, loving the foreigner, loving the stranger, loving those unlike us and unfamiliar to us. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't have boundaries. It doesn't mean that we don't put some special boundaries around our family or around friends. But what it does mean is that we don't live the entirety of our life in the safe zone. We've got to make room for the stranger and for the foreigner. We've got to put on display this extravagant hospitality of God. I sometimes hear people say, well, you know, my, my ministry is to my family. And I get that, and it should be. And ministry to your family is so important, that's got to be priority number one. But your family is not Zenos to you. For the most part, your family is familiar and comfortable, even if they're not familiar and comfortable. They're still your family. And I know there are times in families where a crisis will take place, where literally 100% of all of our time and attention needs to get focused there, but that can't be the norm. We've got to be making room for the stranger, for the foreigner, the outsider, those in need, those who are vulnerable. This hospitality that we've received from God, we extend it to all others. And it's, it's not easy. It's a huge challenge, in fact, in part because our culture doesn't help us with this. Our culture actually pushes back against this. Um, our, our culture, you know, really is, is rather self-absorbed. And I think our culture gets the quid pro quo hospitality, but our culture pushes back against this kingdom hospitality because how do you get paid back for that? And so at Sobel Christian Fellowship and at Blue Water Church, we've got to recognize that we're uh, facing a challenge, a cultural challenge, and to put on display the hospitality of God, we're going to have to be pushing back, pushing against um, the momentum of our quid pro quo culture. And so what we've done at, at Blue Water as a, as a little newish kind of church, we've decided that we need to identify some baby steps in this, to identify some baby steps, to take some baby steps, and then to learn to celebrate those baby steps, to learn how to celebrate just little kingdom wins, even though we've got so much farther to go. It's just that we want to head in that direction. And I would encourage you to, to have the same sort of um, discussions. Um, and we're all, maybe, maybe we're all starting at different places. Some of you might be starting from zero. Some of you might be starting from 50. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where we're starting from. What matters is the direction we're going, the trajectory that we're, that we're on. Let's head in this direction of kingdom hospitality. And one thing that we've got to keep in mind and understand is that all kingdom change begins here. It begins in our thinking. The very first place that we've got to make space for the stranger is in our thinking. Kind of like that Romans chapter uh, 12 verse 2 thing where Paul says, you know, uh, we're transformed by changing the way that we think. And philozenia is never, it's never going to happen out there unless it first starts here. We've got to make space for the stranger in our thinking. We've got to get them on the, the radar screen of our mind. And then I think we, we just kind of move the needle a little bit by making kingdom hospitality a regular part of our conversations, a regular part of our conversations with our family, a regular part of the conversation in our groups, a regular part of the conversation in our church, uh, a regular part of our conversations with God, asking God just to help us to make space for the stranger, to create space for the other. And over the next couple of weeks, we want to um, kind of touch on some practical ways that we can maybe move the needle uh, farther in terms of kingdom hospitality. But let me give you one super simple one uh, today. This would be easier if we weren't social distancing, but it's not impossible because of that. So, you know, imagine you see a stranger at safe distance, somebody that you don't know, they're unfamiliar to you. Uh, maybe they're very different from you. Let me suggest that the first thing you do is bless them. You say, well, how do I bless them? 
Well, this is something that takes place in your mind. This is you praying. And as you see that unfamiliar person, you just pray to God and you say, God, in this moment, I agree with you that that person who is unfamiliar to me is of unsurpassable worth. They're created in the image and likeness of God and they're worth Christ dying for. That's the first thing. Just bless them in your mind in prayer. The second thing is, if you have opportunity, greet them and express their worth just in how you greet them. Express that you're actually happy to see them in how you greet them. And then the third thing, just listen to the voice of Jesus who is inside you. And if you've got ears to hear what he's saying and eyes to see what he's doing in the moment, he will show you how to extend hospitality to that person. And it might be in a very, very small way. It might be in a very big way. It might be in a very small way by just letting them go first or just the opening of a door. Or it might be in a very big way where you actually get to lay down your life for somebody. But before any of that happens, it's gotta begin here in our thinking. We've gotta create space in our thinking for the stranger. If they're not on the radar screen of our mind, we're really gonna be quite oblivious to them out there. Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, verse 47, if you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. It's like Jesus says, big deal, big deal. Even pagans do that. But in the kingdom of Jesus, our attention and our focus and our awareness has to be extended to the other, to the unfamiliar, to the stranger. And then we bless them. We greet them as we have opportunity and we listen to the voice of Jesus as to how we extend hospitality to them in really small ways, maybe really big ways. And this applies on Sunday mornings too. Let's be thinking about when we gather again in person uh, for in-person uh, worship gatherings. Uh, let's be thinking about that because really, if we can't become really proficient here, it's unlikely we're ever gonna become proficient out there. And let me, let me be so bold as to suggest a commitment that you might want to entertain. Was that a soft enough sell? Um, let me suggest that you entertain making a commitment that when we come back to in-person worship, that you come back with a commitment to put on display the hospitality of God. So that when we come back, that you greet and you welcome not only those with whom you're familiar and comfortable, but you actually intentionally greet and welcome those who are unfamiliar to you that you don't know or you don't know well, and maybe they're very different from you. To bless them, to greet them in such a way as to affirm their worth and to ascribe worth to them, to Express worth in how you listen to them. Dallas Willard says the first act of love is the paying of attention to somebody. Let me suggest that that might be a very excellent commitment for each of us to make before we gather again in person. And if I can be even more obnoxiously bold, let me suggest that if you come to the nine o'clock service at Sobel, don't come at 8.59. And certainly don't come at 9.05. Come early so that you can put on display this kingdom hospitality. If you come to the 11 o'clock service, don't come at 10.59 and don't come at 11.05. Come early so that we can engage in, in kingdom hospitality and expressing this love to others. It ought to be absolutely impossible to come to Sobel Christian Fellowship or Blue Water Church on a Sunday morning and not feel welcome. That, uh, that ought to be an absolute impossibility. Sobel Christian Fellowship ought to be the most welcoming place in all of Sobel Beach. And Sobel Beach in the summer is all about welcoming people. This ought to be the most welcoming place at the beach. Love the Zenos. And you know, the, the neat thing is God might use you to express the first tiny injection of love into somebody's life that will ultimately bring them into the kingdom of Jesus. And I believe that if we just do this 
more and more, if each of us do our part as individuals, that Sobel Christian Fellowship and Blue Water Church will become an increasingly welcoming community where outsiders are welcomed in and made insiders. And let me just say this in closing. Um, another great way to carve out space in your life for the other, for those that you don't know, for the unfamiliar, is to get involved in ministry. And when I'm talking about getting involved in ministry, I'm particularly talking about getting involved in ministry in the local church, in regular ministry. There's lots of places that we can become involved in ministry, but I think for the follower of Christ, the first place and the primary place ought to be the local church. I think that honors Christ. And so getting involved in ministry is a really great way to get to know people that you don't know. It's also a great way to serve people that you don't know. And then let me also encourage you to get involved in a group. Getting involved in a group is also a great way to get to know people that you do not know. And groups, once you do get to know each other, groups, it's, it's awesome to engage the power of group and um, to take that, that momentum and then as a group practice philozenia outside of your group. Well, let me just uh, wrap up with prayer here. Would you pray with me, please? God, we thank you that when we were strangers to you, you showed us extravagant hospitality, extravagant philozenia. When we were outsiders, you made us insiders in Christ. When we were dead, you made us alive through faith in Christ. And when we were in need, you did whatever it took. And God, I pray that as your people, that we would more and more really be reflecting your character. That's what it means to be godly. We want to reflect your character. We want to reflect your generosity. We want to reflect your, your extravagant welcome in how we live and how we welcome those who are the strangers, the foreigners, the others those who are unlike us and unfamiliar to us and different from us. And God, I pray that as we learn to do this in, in little ways and big ways, that God, you would just cause your church to grow this welcoming, beautiful place. And would you cause that to happen for our good, for your glory. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, folks. See you next time.